Welcome to Success Story, the most useful podcast in the world. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. The HubSpot Podcast Network is the audio destination for business professionals who seek the best education and inspiration on how to start and scale a business. HubSpot Podcast Network hosts act as on-demand mentors for businesses, entrepreneurs, startups, scale-ups through practical tips and inspirational stories. Listen, learn, and grow with the HubSpot Podcast Network at HubSpot.com com slash podcast network. Today, my guest is John Gannon. John is the founder of Going VC, which is a cohort-based educational program, as well as the VC Careers newsletter, which is the single largest newsletter in existence that matches potential VC career opportunities and job opportunities with people that are looking for their next move or potentially looking to pivot careers or to start fresh by going into a VC job. He noticed a gap between the talent that wants to get into VC and the education surrounding how to actually navigate navigate that process. John had several successful career positions before he started his own thing. He worked at Amazon, VM Turbo, VMware, Scient, FoxSports.com. He was an early stage VC himself at L Capital Partners before he built this incredible community focused on not only educating about VCs, but helping bridge that talent gap and helping people take the next step in their career. Some of the things we spoke about how to get a job in venture capital, how do VCs make money, uh, tips for people that are looking to pivot in their career and to go into VC. We also spoke from the entrepreneurial perspective because he works with so many VCs. He's worked with startups. He's been a VC himself. What should entrepreneurs look for when aligning with a VC? What type of value add does a VC bring to an entrepreneur outside of potentially just money? And then, of course, we spoke through his origin story and some of the things that I spoke about about how he uh, basically built his career, built his side hustle that's now turned into a highly profitable business, Going VC and VC Careers Newsletter, while he was actually still working. So VC lessons, uh, entrepreneurial lessons for any entrepreneur, but also entrepreneurial lessons for somebody who's looking uh, to start a side hustle. John has some great tips. So without further ado, this is John Gannon, founder of Going VC and the VC Careers Newsletter. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely spanned both VCs and and startups and earlier in my so like you mentioned um, early in my career I worked for a company uh, this was back in 2003 actually is when I started with them when there were about 300 people and that was a, a company called VMware and that was really my first taste of a true breakout category defining company and spent approximately four years there. And it was just a, a complete rocket ship when a company is growing, basically doubling year over year consistently. It is an amazing career growth experience because they're, they're growing so fast that there's literally not enough people to do all the work to, to sort of keep the rocket ship moving up or, and to the right. And so I had a great experience there and met a lot of folks who I continue to, to stay in touch with till this day. The other thing that it really helped me sort of do is when I later decided I wanted to move into the venture capital space after business school, having been fortunate to be at a category creating, category defining company, that was something that was incredibly helpful to me when I was trying to convince venture capital firms that I was someone who could come in and, and actually add value to what they were doing on day one and, and be differentiated in terms of the types of investment opportunities and investment thesis that, that I bring, bring to the table. And correct me if I'm wrong, but your path is not a traditional path into venture capital, because from what I understand, you're, you're going, you're an analyst and then you, and you progress from there, right? And you're just pure finance and they don't have careers in tech. So how, how did that, how did you parlay the Is that how it sort of progressed for you? Yeah, I think it's over the, the recent years, I think it's changed a bit. I think what you said was, was absolutely true back when I was sort of getting started in the VC world around 2007, 2008, where you definitely saw a lot more people coming up through sort of a finance background, like you said. What we're seeing now more so is that people are going out and getting operating experience at venture-backed startups. Maybe they're 
a VP of marketing or they're a product manager or they work in engineering or something like that. And they, they take that experience from, from the startup and basically then take those learnings and, and apply them to, to trying to break into venture capital. Uh, sometimes it's because, or, or it's through the fact that the company they worked for actually was invested by a bunch of venture, invested in by a bunch of venture capital firms. And so there's, there's certainly a, a path to sort of connect with, with the investors through those kinds of relationships. But in this market as well, just given the proliferation of capital, right, there's a lot of capital out there and, and just reading TechCrunch every day or really anything in the news, you can, you can see that. But there's been a proliferation of, of VC firms, of angel investors, and, and sort of hybrids in between. And I think one of the things that, I think people maybe don't know about trying to work their way into the venture capital industry is sure uh, you can go to my blog and you can see we post maybe 200 new jobs a month in the VC space. But for all of those jobs, there's a whole set of opportunities that are actually completely off the radar with firms who just simply choose not to sort of share those opportunities publicly, but end up hiring through their networks and referrals and things like that. Uh, which you know, has a variety of, of, of challenges as well, especially when you look at VC in an industry where from a diversity inclusion inspec- uh, perspective has, has not done well at all. Mm-hmm. But, um, but, but there are you know, multiple ways to, to sort of get involved. And, and one more piece of that, which I think is really important and, and sort of ties into some of my work with Going VC, which is really a, a, a platform business where we have a cohort-based education program but tied to that, we also have an investment arm. And we've gone out and we've invested now in close to 20 early stage companies. And we've also built out through our community, uh, a scouting network where the people who are in the program, if they choose to, can actually go out, source companies, do due diligence on those companies. And uh, going to see partners, which is our investment arm, will actually invest in, in some of these, these companies. And so that's, uh, you know, um, for, for me at least, right, uh, clearly I didn't apply for that job. It's, it's something we just kind of created as part of, of going VC. And we see similar things now where you're seeing angel investors really kind of professionalize their work in a way where instead of writing 10 or 25K checks on a per deal basis, they're actually rounding up maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars from people in their network. And then as a single face to the entrepreneur, writing a single check into their company, but basically bringing on, along all this capital that they've in essence raised uh, for on behalf of that entrepreneur. So there's a lot of interesting things going on. So let's, so I want to go into some of those nuances of, of the current state of venture capital, but first I want to just understand because you've built out something very impressive, forget the fact that you have tons of learnings about venture capital investment. I, I guess, why did you even start this venture? Why did you start building this newsletter, this cohort and this community? Because you had a successful career. And just walk me through, I guess, the timeline a little bit, because you said it started back in 2008. Were you still actively part of L Capital or another uh, firm at the time? Or were you back into to tech? Yeah, happy to walk through the origin story. For, for me, it really started in 2006 when I got that phone call from the director of admissions at Columbia Business School saying that I was accepted and that I was gonna be enrolling in uh, early 2007. And the reason that was important in the overall journey is because I don't remember sort of why I decided to do this, but I decided to start blogging, I think it was even that day, about my business school experience. And so during business school, I was blogging frequently about specifically what it was like to go to Columbia, about my specific program. And as I did that, I I sort of enjoyed doing it, but I also enjoyed getting feedback, outreach from folks who would come to me either in person or email me and say, hey, I read your blog, it's great. I'm learning a lot about Columbia, it's got great tips. And and, that that really is is energizing to get that kind of, of feedback. And so I knew what that felt like, even though what I was writing was really for a very sort of specific and, and, and frankly, quite small audience at the end of the day. But I carried that with me when I graduated because 
I went through what everyone who's gone through a venture capital job search knows is, is an extremely long job search process. So venture capital is not the type of industry where it's a three to six month search. It's uh, usually uh, at least a year and maybe even even multi-year. And so I spent all of my time in business school really trying to uh, really trying to break into the industry. And through that process, there wasn't actually a lot of information out there like there is today. So again, rewind like 12, 13 years. There were folks like Fred Wilson, Brad Feld, who, who were blogging. Then there were a few other folks, but it wasn't to the degree today that we have where there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of VC blogs and a lot more transparency around this information. So during that, that journey and during that path, and, and it, it was a pretty lonely one in the sense that I could maybe count three or four other people in our school who actually wanted to go down that same path is when I got the job, I actually said, hey, why don't I create a, a resource, a free resource where I'll just take the stuff that helped me and I'll put it up there and I'll make it available for everyone to, in essence, see and look at and, and learn from. And, and that's really where the blog started. And then over the years, I added job postings. I added the email newsletter, which in retrospect was a mistake to not add that on day one. Uh, definitely, I think, <laughs> missed out on maybe an opportunity there, but uh, I'm definitely happy with, with how things have, have certainly turned out over the years and, and sort of how uh, it's grown and, and there's kind of a community around it as well. I think it's a great resource. And I, and, and I, when I first sort of did a little bit more research into, into what you do, um, it was a little bit, it was new to me. I've never seen anything really like this and I'm, I'm not actively looking for a job in venture capital. So probably if I did a little bit more research, I could probably find, but you are still the first one that I've ever seen who has proactively been putting out newsletters and whatnot in, in the VC world. And I guess it just never thought, I never thought about it as something that, um, had a huge community around it. it like you know i the first thing i mentioned was it's people coming from finance going into this career field so i'm obviously mistaken and i, I appreciate that you do this because i think that a lot of people can possibly operators can possibly make jumps into venture capital and be a valuable asset for some of these firms trying to understand you know who's going to be successful who who isn't going to be successful and so on and so forth so there's a lot of uh, value, I think that this brings to the table for people that are working in early stage startup and trying to figure out what's another option or an alternative option for my career. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, you teach these things probably in the cohort in the newsletter, but what are what are some tips for people that do want to get a job in venture capital? What do they need to do? Because you mentioned it's not a, an easy process. Yeah. So if you want to dig into a bit around how, how does one actually get a, a venture capital job, yeah. one thing I like to, to talk about is what I call the, the five-legged stool. And the five-legged stool is, is really a way to think about like what are, the, what are the, the most important things to a VC? Because if you put yourself in their shoes, you're going to be in a much better position to understand what they need, what they want, and how to add value to them. And so in terms of what are those five legs, what are those things that VCs care about? So one of the most important things is deal flow. So finding companies that are investable and, and, and ideally finding those companies before other people do, <laughs> before it gets competitive. So that's one aspect. There's also for their existing portfolio companies, another leg of the stool is in essence, helping those existing companies go out and raise more money, right? So if I'm Kleiner Perkins and I do a Series A in a company, that company's probably going to need a Series B, right? And there's going to be an investor that, that's going to write that Series B check. And so being able to assist in terms of helping other companies that have already raised venture money kind of go to that next round is another important piece of the job of being a VC. And if you can help a VC with that through your network, that's another big value add. The third is around the investors in the venture capital funds themselves. So they're called limited partners. And so limited partners are, could be high net worth individuals, but if you look at like really big venture funds, like the Sequoias and the Kleiner Perkinses, they're getting their money from large endowments, 
uh, university endowments, uh, uh, you know, folks like the Rockefeller Foundation, right? Like uh, a lot of these really large, longstanding institutions are are ones that are investing in venture capital. And so, if you, as a job seeker, through your network, have access to people in those worlds or high net worth individuals who are interested in investing in venture funds or in startups, that can definitely be a value add, um, particularly for newer funds, which are earlier on in their journey, where they've not necessarily locked up the Princeton endowment to write them a $20 million check, but maybe they're raising a $5 million fund. And so someone who can write a 100K check is actually quite meaningful to them, right? So mm -hmm. that's another area in terms of adding value. Hiring is another piece. So if I'm a VC and I've got, maybe I'm on the board of uh, six, seven, eight companies, one of the most important things that I'm trying to do is make sure that company is staffed properly, has the best talent. And although I'm not directly responsible for it, my CEOs at those companies that I work with are gonna kind of expect that I'm gonna be sending them really high quality folks who could potentially become employees or executives at those companies. And so if you can help with that through your personal network, that's another way you can add value to a to a VC straight away. And then there's a kind of a fifth bucket, which is around business development sales and, and M&A, which is if you can help a VC's portfolio get in front of people who can buy their products, buy their company, or otherwise partner, that's a, a big value add as well. So as a job seeker, it's kind of up to you to like inventory your network and your skills and your interests and figure out out of those five legs, you're not gonna knock all of them out of the park, but there's probably a couple that you would kind of gravitate to or have a strength in. And those are the things that you'd wanna lean on in terms of how you wanna conduct your search and, and sort of which firms you might wanna approach with what kind of pitch, and then how would you deliver value to them to really show them before you even have a job that you're someone who could actually do the job. Do you have um, do you have examples of how somebody would would show value? Because it seems like uh, for for some jobs, it seems like a simple project or or something could show some sort of value to a hiring manager. But for a venture capital firm, would it be an introduction to somebody? I guess it depends on what what value you bring to the table. But it seems like it's a big ask before you even sit down with somebody to show value. So do you have a, a, an idea of how you could do that? So. To make sure I understand the question you're asking, how specifically can a candidate show value in one of those areas? Yeah, 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 sure. So deal flow is, is is a great one to talk about because it's one that's critical, right? To a VC, they have to make new investments, and so they need deal flow. They need to be ideally getting to these companies before other folks do. And so, an example would be maybe you went to, to school with a bunch of folks who out of that group, there, there's a few who maybe they started their own businesses while they were in school, or maybe they were just like insanely smart. And they were the kind of people where you looked at and you said, you know, that person is, they're going to really do great things in their career. So if you are in touch with those kinds of people from, could be your childhood, could be from your college experience, could be people you've worked with previously, kind of keeping tabs on what they're working on. And if you see them working on a new thing that looks like something that could fit into the venture back startup space, i.e. a software company, an internet company, right? Those, those types of things. Then if you're trying to build relationships with VCs, those are the kind of folks where you want to try to be that connection basically between the people from your network and, and the VCs. Because it's very compelling if you're you know, starting to, to, to develop a relationship with a VC to be able to come to them and say, uh, hi, you know, this is, um, I, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Jen. She started this uh, amazing software company. She was uh, at the top of our class at um, Penn State. And, you know, I, I, I really would highly recommend that, that you take a look at this company. And, and oh, by the way, they've already got some paying customers or, you know, whatever the case may be in terms of their status. Like that is a great way to uh, both deepen a, a relationship with a VC, but also uh, can, can give you a reason to get in touch with VCs as well. 
uh, one of the things that I talk a lot about and we focus on in our Going VC program is developing what we call an investment thesis. And an investment thesis is really your sort of unique view on a certain sector or, or market. And by uh, sort of a, a well-defined view, what I mean by that is having the ability to deep dive on that entire sector, the companies that are in that sector, both the big ones that are maybe public and also the smaller ones that are just getting funded and everyone in between. And then having a really specific angle in terms of which uh, types of companies in that sector you would invest in and why. So as someone who's trying to get in touch with VCs or get them interested, it's it's also quite compelling to to, to actually create a almost in a written form, uh, pretty commonly, you might see a 15, 20 slide deck that really articulates that thesis. And, and I've seen folks in our program create these investment uh, thesis, sort of document them and then share them out on LinkedIn. And I, I just emailed my list about this actually a couple of days ago. Uh, there was a, a, a team of folks who were in my going DC program, two people, uh, they, they created an investment thesis around ag tech. Uh, they, they posted it and the the post got over 30 i checked the other day got over 30 comments and over 100 reactions and even mm -hmm. got an inbound at least one inbound that's the only one i know about there could be more from a vc who said hey i saw this investment thesis i'd love to talk to you right which is what you want but like uh, then yeah. it's going the other way yeah. where they're coming to you which is is obviously superior to you going in and sort of uh, asking someone if they have any kind of opportunity very interesting. Um, thank you for breaking that down. So the one other thing that I really wanted to unpack, um, because again, if somebody isn't in this space, they may not know how do VCs make money. And and I got this I got this point. I was reading your blog and I was learning about uh carry, and I don't know much about carry. So I'm curious about where the money comes from, what are the expectations going into a career in venture capital? Are you expecting to you know, make as much money as I'm assuming somebody would presume they would in venture capital, which outside looking in, it seems like they, they all do quite well. Um, or are the expectations a little bit out of touch with reality? Yeah. For, for a junior investment professional, there's probably better ways you can make money. So I definitely wouldn't say you, you might do better as an investment banker in your early career than you would as a, mm -hmm. as a VC for the funds that are, successful, they are generating carried or carried interest, like you said, and, and sort of the way it works at a high level is uh, these these VCs, right, they, they they have investors in their own funds, right? So let's say they, they go out and raise, uh, just to keep the numbers simple, a, uh, a $10 million fund. Well, the way carried interest works is if they invest that 10 million and then they get back that 10 million uh, plus another 10 million, right? So they've, they've basically doubled the double the money and I'm, I'm simplifying it a bit. There's a little more nuance in here, but this is basically how it works. Yeah. No, no, that's good. So, that's good. so that 10 million in gain, what the carried interest is, is it's a piece of the gain. And typically with most venture firms that the, that percentage is 20%. So if we talk about 10 million in gain, 20% would be 2 million. And okay. if you're looking at early stage venture capital, it, it could be six, seven, eight, ten 10 years if a company actually sells, right? And generates returns, right? So a lot yeah. of these flame out. Yeah. So in terms of a way to, 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 to get rich quick, it's definitely not that because you need to have a fund that's generating positive returns. And, and like I said, it takes a long time for that to happen. Now, for funds that are uh, larger, they uh, it, it can be more financially lucrative um, even without the carry from the perspective mm -hmm. that if you look at a firm, like a very large firm, like a, say a Sequoia their lifetime as a fund, but it's billions, right? And the other piece to VC comp is it comes out of the, uh, they call it a management fee, which is like typically around 2% of the uh, total amount of capital and it's uh, it's taken out each year and it, it kind of trends down over time because the investment cycle sort of slows down as you uh, deploy more of the capital. But if you think about a firm that maybe has two or three funds running in parallel, 
which you often see because a firm may raise a fund and then raise another one in two or three years, those management fees kind of stack up. And so salary-wise at the larger firms, you could definitely expect to have a base salary uh, that's a you know that's a bit higher than at a firm that say maybe only has fifty million dollars in assets under management. There's just not as much of that. That two percent is just a lot a lot smaller. Is because you said there's a surplus of capital because we see we see so many companies being invested in. Is this? Um, do you feel like the the uh, the industry is is reaching a point where? Uh, many of the investments will no longer see positive returns or fizzle out or flare out or die out. And there's poor investments being made. Like one notable is uh, WeWork. And obviously that's a sort of like a Hollywood uh, style investment that didn't didn't go so well. So do you see more of these events happening or do you think it's a healthy market and the companies that are being invested in are going to yield the returns that are expected? I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. HubSpot's CRM is the easiest tool you can ever find to align your team. There are two features that you need in a CRM that optimize every activity your team does. It's the ability to communicate, meaning chat, email, etc., messaging, as well as a unified system of record. Your company is going to use a CRM to manage conversations with prospects and customers throughout all stages of the buyer journey. And as your company grows, these conversations get a little bit more difficult. Information may get lost. Communication may be disjointed and HubSpot solves all that. Using HubSpot as your CRM makes sure that all of your communication and your records are unified across your entire organization, meaning that from when you first have that initial touch point with the customer and they enter your funnel all the way through to when they actually sign that contract and after with customer success, every piece of information, every bit of communication is aligned and congruent across your company. You can install live chat on your website and allow sales or support to talk to prospects directly. You can send marketing emails on behalf of a sales rep to complement their outbound campaign. You can allow prospects to book meetings directly from marketing emails right into a sales rep's calendar. And all the interaction, all the communication is seamlessly documented into the, your HubSpot CRM so that if somebody else has to look into an account or to help out, they know exactly where the last person left off. Best of all, with HubSpot's various price points and flexible pricing, any company at any stage can take advantage of the various features features that HubSpot has to offer, starting with free and allowing for more scalability and complexity as your organization grows. Learn how to scale your company without scaling complexity at HubSpot.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Well, with, with so much capital going into the industry as of late, you, there, there's, and I think this would be true even rewind four or five years ago, like there's always going to be companies that, that maybe shouldn't be funded, but, but someone's willing to fund them. So they, they, they raise money and many of those companies will, will flame out. But I think what's maybe more interesting is that valuation, the sort of the, the, the price at which the companies are being invested in are, are universally up across the board. So later stage companies, pre-IPO companies, growth equity sort of stage companies, those valuations you know, sort of uh, started to go up uh, I would say first in the last few years, mm -hmm. but now we're seeing it trickle down mm -hmm. where even companies at the seed and pre-seed stage, pre stage are seeing those valuations up. I, I couldn't quote you an exact percentage, but they're definitely higher yeah. directionally than say three or four years ago. And so what that means for the VCs is in some cases, because they're not able to buy as much ownership in these companies for the same amount of capital, the return profile is potentially going to be lower. Now, VC is a hits business. So if they get if they invest in the next Uber, if they made a billion versus 900 million, like, you know, it, it sort of comes out on the wash. And, and yeah. you know, I don't think anyone's going to complain if they return you know, 50, 60 times the amount of capital in a fund to their investors, which that would be a smash hit, by the way, that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. <laughs> um, now, what about, what about for the investor, though? Like, like, flip the script. So for the investor, if, if companies are being, uh, they have higher valuations, um, is there more pressure on the, uh, on, on the entrepreneur, excuse me, is there more, is there more pressure on the entrepreneur to perform, to reach milestones quicker, to raise their next series quicker? Is it, is it almost detrimental on the, 
on the health of a company? So, you know, venture investors, right? They, they, they want companies to move uh, as quickly as possible. You know, they, 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 they can't necessarily wait 20 years for them to be able to get returns, right? They, they want to get returns as, as soon as possible. Yeah. And so, uh, there, there's that dynamic. Another dynamic is VCs. You know, they want to see, they want to see their companies, uh, frankly, get get marked up by other firms in subsequent rounds, and, and this can come into play, especially with newer firms, where maybe they're trying to establish a track record, and so they're not going to have a company exit necessarily within two or three years. But if they can show that there's been some markups of existing companies where they went on raised an, another round at a higher valuation. Um, that, that's a that's a positive for that that firm, and I think specifically in this market, what we're definitely seeing is more uh, preemptive financings, where you'll see a company maybe raise a seed round, and then six months later they'll raise a Series A opportunistically. Whereas normally you wouldn't go out and raise an A six months after you raise your seed, you'd probably take that seed a year or so and then go out and raise. So I think that's a good example of sort of the the uh, the level of uh, of froth, I guess, in the market. Mm -hmm. And and would you recommend um, again for for entrepreneurs? You we mentioned before how operators are moving into venture capital roles. Do you recommend that uh, entrepreneurs find roles that prioritize operators on their team versus firms that don't? I don't know if that's a fair question. Or if firms exist that don't have operators. I'm sure some do, smaller ones. Um, what's your opinion on that? In terms of how to position yourself as an entrepreneur, if you're looking to break into VC, I, there's a couple of angles you could take and, and you, you would have to suss it out based on the firm. So there's some VC firms that very clearly, you look at the staff, it's all former operators, right? So those are definitely firms that, that would probably look at your background as an entrepreneur and, and that would resonate to a certain degree with them. Not a guarantee you would get a job or anything, but mm -hmm. but that would be almost like table stakes to even sort of get in the room with them. Yeah. But I think there's also an angle where, you know, I've seen firms where they, they actually, they, they're sort of lifetime investors and were not operators, but they saw value to bring an entrepreneur in to, to basically round them out because you do, I don't think there's any world where that background is not valuable when it comes to investing. Like operating experience, I think it's always, it always helps. It probably sometimes can, can create some challenges as well, but overall it's a net positive. So I think in those cases with firms who maybe don't have a strong operator to, to sort of position yourself as, as that, that you could sort of maybe fill that gap. I don't know if I'd say it as bluntly, but I think that might be more the angle that, that you'd want to take. No, no, it, it's fair. It's a, it... yeah, no, I, that, that was my, I guess it was just wondering, like wondering where you should end up, uh, as, as an entrepreneur, what, where can you provide the most value, but also at the same time, where, where's the best environment for you? That's also important. If you're looking for a career, I was actually, I, I was actually referring to, um, as an entrepreneur trying to raise money, but also in the, in the, in the sense of uh, looking for a career option, that also makes sense to me. Um, one thing, and I guess just I guess to to pick your brain on the on the current state of of investment. Explain to me something, and I'm trying to understand this. I'm trying to wrap my head around it. So SPACs. So why are those more relevant now? I know they've been around for a while. What place do they have in venture capital? Um, I know that uh, Chamath uh, took. Uh, I guess it was. Uh, uh, social capital, uh, he to Sophia Holdings, and and they bought a forty nine percent stake in Virgin Galactic. Uh, Bill Ackman uh, raised a four billion dollar SPAC. These are all obviously topical now. What place do they have? Are they going to be relevant long term? Are they just a fad? Are these things that people should care and learn about? I'm just curious. Yeah, on SPACs, I'll admit I'm not an expert, but I'll give you my quick take on it, and folks can 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 run with it or not. With SPACs, it seems like it's a really <laughs> another vehicle for a company, its shareholders to, to in essence, experience uh, an exit, right? So there's there's SPACs, there's obviously traditional IPOs, direct listings, right? Um, secondary sales where you have companies just selling uh, or people 
within companies selling shares on the private market. So it's another, I guess, tool in the toolkit in terms of getting liquidity for employees or uh, existing investors. So they're 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 just another they're not they're another vehicle. It's it's something that can be used, but in terms of you know your expertise, like if somebody's looking for a career, these these have no bear. These are just something else that you should understand as you start to venture out into this world as something that could be a an option that you may have to you know I guess facilitate with an organization or a company you're trying to to take public because that's obviously the end goal. I'm assuming through the various rounds, and then you have the end goal of actually IPOing or doing some sort of public listing. Yeah, for a VC job seeker, if you will, you definitely want to understand facts. You want to understand what what sort of the major news around them in terms of are there some SPACs mm-hmm. recently that are tied to certain high profile companies, but it's probably not the thing you're going to run into day to day as a VC. It's, okay. If you were going to put like on the priority list of like having great deal flow versus understanding yeah. facts like... <laughs> Uh, understanding these facts wouldn't even be on the list, frankly. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, fair enough. Um, okay. So that was pretty, uh, I, I appreciate that. So we went, uh, we went pretty deep on, on some advice for people looking to get into to VC and venture capital careers. Um, is there any other points that you wanted to bring up? Because I wanted to, I wanted to just pull out some career lessons from you over your career that are, that will be good for our audience. But is there any other pointers, tips for people that uh, want to go into venture capital careers that we didn't touch on? That I did I, I wasn't smart enough to ask you. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> Happy to to share one other thing that I think is super important when I, I actually think it really applies to all careers, but it's particularly important in a well networked industry like VC and, and startups. Mm-hmm which is going to your interviews, whether they're formal or informal over a, eventually a cup of coffee, because you can actually spend time with people in person again now, yeah. is really coming with a prepared mind about how you can help that person and, and like having a couple specific ideas in mind and using the five-legged stool framework that I talked about. Mm-hmm. There's no reason that before you have that next interview or that next coffee meeting, you couldn't take 15 or 20 minutes to think about that person, that firm, and then look into your your LinkedIn, your Rolodex, whatever you like to use to sort of track who you're connected to and come up with a couple of ideas for them. And I, I do this myself. I was meeting with uh, the CEO of uh uh, a company backed by uh, NEA and, and Benchmark. Uh, it's an enterprise software company. And I was meeting with the CEO. And before I met with them, I went to their jobs page and I saw who they were hiring. And then I went to him and say, oh, I saw you're hiring for this position. There's someone I know who could be great. Do you want to talk to them? Right. And you're not going to hit it every time in terms of having an idea or a good idea. <laughs> but if you practice that over the course of the hundreds or thousands of meetings you're going to have over your career, you'll start to kind of build a muscle around it. And it's just an opportunity to really add value immediately to someone and really make a great first impression, right? BCs need a ton of people and it's hard to be someone who they, they remember and doing things like that can a help them remember. And B, if you get back in touch with them, they're more likely to remember whatever the thing is that you suggested or that you helped them with or that connection you made. Very good. Good advice. And I think that is, that's, that's incredible. Just general career advice. Um, you made a good point that in a, in a, in an industry that is as high network where they do see as many people as, as they do, because that's literally every single day is meetings with brand new people trying to pitch them on themselves and their product and their company. Um, you have to show a little bit more. <laughs> you have to bring a little bit more to the table to stand out. So that's very, very good advice. Um, okay, so some lessons from your career. Uh, I want to understand just a few items because you've had success in building your community, your newsletter, your cohort. Uh, so as you've built this out, what was the biggest challenge that you faced in building this out and how did you overcome it? These things in terms of in the venture capital space over the course of my career, 
these different programs, courses, the newsletter, et cetera, it's really time. And how do you maximize your time so that you're able to work on those things, you're able to get a reasonable amount of rest, you're able to spend time with your family. I'm married, I have three kids. So that's critically important to me. If you're working full time somewhere and you're doing these other things, right? How do you balance it all? And so one of, uh, I would say one of the best sort of career decisions I made, and this was going on, I want to say maybe seven years ago now, is I hired a virtual assistant and I had them help me with everything from making appointments for me with a doctor to putting up content on my blog. And it really taught me that you can get an incredible amount of leverage if you're willing to delegate even things that you might by default say, oh, I can just go do that myself. Like, oh, I can call the doctor myself or, oh, I can, I can find a store that, that sells that thing myself, right? But actually delegating it and being able to do that delegation in a way that is not dependent on time. And what I mean by that is if on a Saturday, I remember that next week I need to go and find a, a gluten-free birthday cake, which is like a real thing uh, that that's <laughs> like I've had to do is being able to email someone and say, Hey, I need to find a gluten-free birthday cake and I need to be able to pick it up next week. And, and for them to, to go and do that legwork. And that that's kind of a personal example. And then on the side of the blog, for example, started within the last several years posting actual jobs to the blog. Originally it was just career advice and then I started posting jobs and I would not personally be able to post the 150 plus jobs that I post on that blog every month without help, right? It just wouldn't happen. And so being able to really scale that by first working with a virtual assistant and now I work with a bunch of folks who are sort of part-time who work with me on that versus a, a virtual assistant who, who's kind of doing all manner of, of, of personal assisting and professional things. So that is, is one thing I would say is, you know, anyone who, just to keep it simple, you know, if you're making say a hundred K or more a year, I would argue that you should have an assistant. Yeah. Very good advice. Very good advice. And actually, um, you know, that's the number one thing that I think that people who are just starting to do their own thing, haven't acclimated to and really, really gotten used to hiring somebody to do these small little things that you think you can do. Why can't I do them myself? That's silly. I'm not going to pay somebody. But the, the second you do that, you realize the momentum of the thing you're building or the thing you're doing. It just seems to take off. Like it's just, it's incredible because then you realize, like you said, you said it perfectly, the levers that you have. Um, very, very, very smart advice. And I, I do think uh, that, you know, if you are making over 100K, there's better things that you can do with your time, regardless of whether or not you have a, a side hustle. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm a big fan of building out your own personal brand, obviously. So I think that everybody should be focusing and trying to do that regardless. But uh, no, I'm very, very smart. Um, and okay. Well, I wanted to throw one more thing yeah. in because I'm really passionate about this this topic and, and I don't actually write or talk a lot about it just by virtue sure. of yeah. I, I focus a lot on, on VC stuff. But in terms of building, like, like it may seem daunting to like, oh, I got, I have to go and like find this person and hire them. And then I have to figure out what to give them. Right. There's like five, six, seven steps. And, and you're not even going to get to step two before you're like, this seems like too much. I'm not going to do it. Right. <laughs> but you can really start to build that muscle by using task based virtual assistant services or marketplaces. So Fiverr is one where you can hire someone to do a very simple task for you. It could be proofreading a document. It could be some basic internet research. There's one I use Fiverr. Uh, there's one I use called Fancy Hand, which is like kind of a, a funny name, but uh, basically it's a task-based virtual assistant service. I am going to be doing some travel soon. And so literally last night I was pinging them with a bunch of requests, just kind of researching the place we're going and things we should do and where we should eat and, and, and things like that. And it's a, those are very low risk ways to like learn how to work with an assistant or someone who would have the same profile as an mm -hmm. assistant. And, and just like starting there and, and like kind of building that muscle and you'll have an aha moment when you do that. 
like when you send someone a document to proofread and they find six things that you wouldn't have found and it made your work better, it made your blog post better, maybe it made the thing you're going to give your boss tomorrow better, right? Like, I, I just, uh, there's a lot of opportunity and I think venture backable type opportunities in and around that space, not necessarily virtual assistant companies, but I think there's a world where, again, there will be a lot of people who will have either dedicated or they'll be leveraging some of these per task type of services to, to kind of give them superpowers basically yeah. to allow them to be 10 X more productive in their day job or 10 X more productive in terms of whatever business they might be building. Yeah, no, that's good. I've never heard of fancy hands before I use Upwork myself, Fiverr. I've used a lot. Um, fancy hands. I'm gonna have to check that out. That's a new one, but <laughs> good, good <laughs> advice. Um, okay. What would be uh, one lesson that you could tell your younger self? One lesson that I could tell my younger self would, would be that there is no such thing as a once in a lifetime opportunity. So when I was younger, I would often see some kind of a job and I'd say, oh, that, that's, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I think if you are focused on your career and, and kind of moving forward in it, you'll, you'll kind of, I think, learn this lesson on your own in that you'll you'll start to realize that uh, there's no such thing there's just a lot of great opportunities if you are able to sort of be in the right place at the right time frankly uh, but also in terms of uh, just you know really trying to do sort of the best job that you can it sounds a little kind of trite but it's true and uh you know i think those things if you're doing those things and, and catch a few lucky breaks or meet sort of the, the right people along the way that uh you're going to see lots of things that seem like once in a lifetime opportunities. So kind of nullifying the whole <laughs> once in a lifetime yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Very good. Um, what's, uh, who is one person that had a major impact on your life and what was that impact? What did you learn from that person? So the person that influenced me the most in terms of my career and sort of how I approach work is, is my dad. So, I remember growing up, my dad, uh, my parents were divorced. Uh, my dad had a day job, but also he did a lot of work on the side. He did work on boats. Uh, he actually did work at the daycare center where I used to go to sort of defray the cost of, of the daycare as well. And I remember going with him like to the daycare center on weekends for him to do that work. And I don't know for sure, but I, I think that made a big impression on me in terms of, you know, really, you know, kind of working hard, um, providing. And, uh, you know, I think that that really rubbed, rubbed off on me for sure. That, that work ethic that, that he had and still has, you know, he's retired, but he's still, still working on boats and, and doing things like that. So yeah, it, it, I think I'd have to say my dad. Good. All right. Um, no, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the answer. And, and it is usually, it, it always does default to a, a parent or somebody close in the family, but it's always interesting. Some of the, some of the lessons and some of like the, you know, the, the, the things that parents taught us or grandparents taught us that they really had no idea they were teaching us at the time. It was just through like day-to-day -day actions. He sounds like an incredible person, uh, offsetting the cost of daycare by working there. That's, that's, uh, that's hard. That's that's a that's a hardworking man. Good good on him. Um, uh, a recommendation for the audience uh, uh, for a book, a podcast, something that they should go check out um, that they can learn from that you obviously have enjoyed. Yeah, in terms of uh, book recommendations, there's there's two books that I I think are excellent, and uh, one of them I, I actually gift pretty frequently. To folks in going VC or just other people who who work with me. So uh, the first book is called Million Dollar Consulting, and it's by Alan Weiss, and he is a lifelong sort of solo practitioner management consultant, and he's built a million dollar at this point, probably a lot more practice as a solo practitioner of consulting, which is pretty impressive. And the book is just it's a great tutorial on how to be a professional how to sell consultatively. It's uh, got some great stories in it. it it's, it's an excellent book. Highly recommend it. Good. And then there's a marketing author 
sort of guru type, and I mean guru in 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 a complimentary way. Sometimes that, <laughs> that term is not used in a complimentary way, but but in this case it is. Is there's a, a Jay Abraham who has written a few books, and the book that I felt was it's been really it's a book I actually go back to constantly. I gift it. And it has really unique perspectives. Like a lot of business books are kind of saying the same thing, in my opinion, um, mm-hmm. for better or for worse. This is a book with a lot of unique ideas I've not seen anywhere else. And it's called uh, Getting Everything That You Can With All That You Got. I think that's the title. I'd have to go back on Amazon. It's, it's a bit of a mouthful of a title. But yeah. if you look up Jay Abraham on Amazon, you, you can find his book. It's got a white cover, black writing on it. And it's, it's great. And, and one of the things he really pushes in that book calls it the strategy of, of preeminence and that is really a strategy where similar to what i was talking about before where you're really trying to figure out how do i add value to this person that i'm trying to work for or this person that i want to partner with or this person that i want to sell to and really coming at it from a perspective of of, of helping them and, and and sort of thinking of them as you know if as a as as almost like a trusted friend, what would a friend do to really mm-hmm. help this person move forward with whatever they're trying to do? He's got a lot of other interesting things around different revenue models, business models, and things like that that are pretty creative and interesting. So yeah, that's one I really like as well. Those are two books that have never been brought up on the show, and I do I do know the book Million Dollar Consulting. Um, I don't I don't know the second one. I'm gonna have to look it up. I'm gonna have to listen back and get that title and and go pull it off Amazon. Um, but no, those are great recommendations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. because a lot of a lot of the books end up you know they end up being the same, but those are two brand new ones. So I, I appreciate that a lot. Um, okay. Uh, last question before I get some socials and web from you. Um, this is. This is, I guess, the most important question, in my opinion. Um, what does success look like and mean to you? Success to me means having as much control over your time and how you spend it as possible. It's, it's not about the money per se. It's really about on a given day, am I working on the things that I want to work on? And am I not working on the things that I don't want to work on? Am I able to spend time with the people I want to spend time with? Am I able to have a, a schedule where I can prioritize family over work and, and, and things like that? I, I think to me, that is what, what success is. And I don't think I'm, I'm there yet, but I do certainly think that as someone who now is uh, sort of uh, early 40s, uh, you know, I think I'm a lot further along than I was in my early 20s. So I guess I'm making progress. <laughs> No, it's very good. Good. Um, uh, and then obviously, uh, where do we connect with you, your social, your website, where can people subscribe and go check out your newsletter? Yeah. Happy to share some of the socials and links and whatnot. So Twitter is John M. Gannon. My blog is at johngannonblog.com, which has a lot of these VC resources. And then there's my going VC uh, program. And there's a lot of educational content there as well. And that's at goingbc.com. 